Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, communities of color organize against state violence. Muslim community activists Lamis Deek and Fahad Ahmed talk about Islamophobia, and we talk to Chicago teachers who are organizing community-wide against racism and the school-to-prison pipeline. All that and more on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a backseat to those who are doing it. What is it about Palestine and Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism that even many liberal Americans still don't get? We're not even talking about the out-and-out -out racism of a certain Republican presidential candidate. Earlier this year, New York Governor Cuomo went so far as to declare an executive order against the Palestinian boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Hillary Clinton's called it evil on campus. At the same time, alliances between Arab, Black, Latino, and Asian struggles are growing here and internationally. What role do law and lawyers play in making the radical and structural change people are seeking? And what's happened since the bad old days of 9-11? Wasn't Obama supposed to end the abuses of the war on terror? Our next guests can report from the ground. Fahad Ahmed is director of DRUM, South Asian Organizing Center, a membership-led group of low-wage South Asian immigrant workers and youth in New York City. He came to the U.S. as an undocumented immigrant from Pakistan in 1991. Lamis Deek is a human rights attorney and activist originally from Nablus in Palestine. Now she's based in New York. She's represented high-profile defendants, including Ahmed Farhani, who was targeted in an NYPD sting operation which lured marginalized men into a manufactured plot of conspiracy to commit terrorism. She's currently chief counsel to the Global Justice and Human Rights Law Network, the founder of the Muslim Defense Project of the National Lawyers Guild, and part of the growing international legal movement for war crimes prosecution in the Middle East and North Africa. Welcome both. Glad to have you. Let's start with the specific. How do you define the question of Islamophobia? What is it to you, Fad? I think you know there, there's different levels of it. Uh, obviously, there is the uh, explicit anti-Muslim bias and bigotry, uh, but then there's also, I think, particularly in, in liberal circles and in left circles, there is a, a very Eurocentric perception uh, of what progress is and what the evolution of societies and communities are. Can you give me an example? Uh, when a lot of liberal perspectives and left perspectives look at movements in South Asia in the Middle East. They look at them with the expectation that they should have the same evolution, speak the same language, and look the same way that we do. They've read Marx and all the rest. And, and, and it's almost like a checklist has to be met before there's even a condition, uh, the conditional possibility of engagement. And what it misses out is the organic nature in how either movements, communities, individuals are developing, uh, how their ideas are developing specific to their particular context. So tell us a little bit about who you work with. When you say South Asian, what do you mean exactly at DRUM? So we're a membership-based organization, and we work with people from South Asia or the South Asian diaspora. So that's Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, but also the diaspora from Southeast Asia, East Africa and from the Caribbean, Trinidad and Guyana. Um, and we work particularly with working class segments of our communities, those who bear the overwhelming brunt of uh, discriminatory policies, whether it's in the form of policing, surveillance, immigration policies, as workers or as youth in underfunded schools. You mentioned earlier, Lemis, that although there was an explosion of violence after 9-11, that wasn't the end of the story. It hasn't gone away, right? No, certainly. I think that was the very beginning of it. Um, and, it, if, you know, it's important to contextualize that none of this is new. Uh, what is new is the way that we discuss it, right, and, and how much more organized the repression is against Arabs and Muslims and South Asians in particular. This has a very long history in the United States. It became more acceptable to talk about it and to legislate it that specifically after 9-11, and this exponentially increased at 2008. In fact, at the time that President Obama had been elected, I had countless Arab clients, non-clients, people that I organized with, come to me and say that they were actually picked up by state authorities, by government authorities, and interrogated, interviewed, as they called it, about what they thought was going to happen after, um, now that Obama was going to be elected in their, their countries of origin. Right? That was really the beginning. And then we saw a gross, rapid explosion 
of anti-Muslim repression in the city. And, and I think a lot of that came not just from the federal government, but also from state agencies as well. Remind us about that Ahmad Farani case, which people may have forgotten. So that was one of the, the first New York State terrorism cases brought under the new terrorism statute. It was a New York State, one that was rejected by, it was brought by the NYPD and rejected by the FBI and in fact by the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And it was really an example of the gross amounts of abuse uh, employed by the NYPD in their very desperate attempt to criminalize specifically the Palestinian movement, but also the Arab and Muslim activists and organizing communities at large. The same, we had uh, two infiltrators enter uh, Al-Auda, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition, use the cre their credibility in those organizations to then infiltrate a whole host of other community-based Muslim organizations, largely Arab organizations, and even left organizations outside of New York. Um, after having failed and spent millions of dollars on this two-year-long operation after having failed to find any criminal wrongdoing by this plethora of organizations and individuals, myself being a target as well, um, what they decided to do was target a very, you know, you know, infirm young man who was poor, he had a petty criminal history, and he had a very long history of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was picked up by the NYPD themselves from the time he was 16 years old and institutionalized, taken to Bellevue and other mental health hospitals. He'd been suicidal since then. They manipulated him, got him to say a few choice words that they thought would overcome uh, an entrapment defense and you know, manufactured entirely, really, mm. this whole plot of terrorism. They had the cameras set up even before the arrest had happened. And you know, it was it was terrible, but it was great that the media was able to see through it. Mm. And it also coincided and, and it's related to the AP leaks, the leaked documents of the Secret Demographics Unit, the terrible training, the way that they were having these officers engage and and essentially set up these people. Long story short, the, the media, the courts were able to see through you know, uh, through what was happening and through the government's claims, we ultimately ended up with a sentence that would have been what he would have gotten mm -hmm. had he not been accused of terrorism. Has anything changed since these cases that Lamise and others have managed to bring to light? Not really. Um, I think what we see is just an evolution in the techniques uh, and an evolution in sort of how the messaging happens. But on the ground, the same thing continues, if not worse. Special registration, what is that? So, it, you know, it's a, it's a series of policies that have taken place over the last uh, 16 years. Um, in, immediately after 9-11, there was massive sweeps that happened in the streets of New York City and, and then the surrounding areas. Over 1,200 men were picked up uh, from their homes, from the streets, from their workplaces. And we set up a hotline, and we literally were getting calls of, from women saying, my husband left for work three days ago, he hasn't come home, we don't know where he is. These sweeps continued for the first year and a half after 9-11. Almost all of those men were deported. Yeah. One year after 9-11 was a, the government instituted a special registrations program, which required men above the ages of 16 from 29 different countries, all of them Muslim countries, with the exception of North Korea, to make it diverse. Uh, these men were required to register with the government. 83,000 registered, 13,000 were put into deportation proceedings. Um, and again, in both of these cases, they found zero people with any connections to any forms of terrorism or any wrongdoing. And so it's around that time that really the infrastructure around the infiltration of communities started to be set up because they realized that these open policies were not yielding results. And so by April, May of 2002 is when we started getting reports of, uh, you know, the uh, law enforcement agencies started doing community engagement efforts. We want to talk to the community, we want to work with the community, we want to figure out who the right people are that we need to pick up. 
And immediately we started getting reports from people saying like, oh, they invited me to come to their office and then they asked me to collect license plate numbers. I think that it's important to look at the culture and the media's role in this, and historically so, and how that's really permeated school culture and home culture and civil society. Looking back at you know Sesame Street in the 70s, right? The correlation of an Arab-looking man with the word danger, for example. But also at more sinister and really well-managed operations, specifically, and this will really Relate to the issue of Palestine, which we'll discuss, but specifically groups who are really committed to the criminalization and the censorship of anybody who would be sympathetic to, you know, forward thinking or anti-Zionist or pro-Palestinian work. And you have to look at the role of Zionist organizations um, and the Israeli government in really perpetuating and organizing and keeping at the at the forefront this idea, you know, that Muslims, Arabs, uh, South Asians, people who would be naturally sympathetic, people of color generally, Africans, blacks in the US, you know, as demonized and criminalized as possible. And if you look at the Islamophobia network, as it's, it's been called, two thirds of those organizations dedicated to perpetuating anti-Muslim rhetoric and, po and policies are actually Zionist and or have ties directly to the Israeli government. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. And unless we're addressing that, then we're also not really addressing the core issues behind Islamophobia and why it's it why these issues have not been really overcome or addressed by liberals and a leftist, and that's all tied together, in my opinion. There's a tendency in U.S. social movements to focus on either the international or the domestics, and a lot of the domestic groups say they're not going to deal with international affairs at all. That doesn't only not work in the context of what you're talking about, Lamise. It actually backfires. Can can you talk about that? Well, that's, that's not how repression operates. I mean, repression is coordinated internationally. It's coordinated globally. I mean, there, it's no coincidence that we're seeing the Israeli government, for example, push you know this line about how to handle the BD, the boycott, divest, and sanctions movement, and the actual criminalization. Aside from Cuomo's executive order, I'm talking about there's a test case right now brought by the Kings County Prosecutor's Office against a young man. In, in that case, you know, the judge during a conference asked the prosecution on that case, why are you bringing this as a hate crime? Do you have a quota to fill? Because the case is trying to criminalize anti-Zionism, not just equate it, but to actually criminalize anti-Zionism as a hate crime in and of itself. Right? It's not a coincidence that we're seeing that case, Cuomo's order, and the Israeli government's, you know, they just convened a conference at the UN. The same forces are all operating together. Repression never happens in a vacuum. Tell us about some of the alliances that you're seeing that we can maybe get excited about. What's going on out there? Um, so we base our work in building alliances uh, across the mass memberships that we have. Um, so it's thinking about the youth that we're organizing around school to prison pilot pipeline policies, uh, immigrants around anti-immigrant policies and detentions and deportations. Uh, families that have been targeted by these entrapment cases and surveillance cases, young people that have been targeted by the police. All of these are things that are not uh, completely exclusive to our community. Uh, there are overlaps with other communities as well. So what happens when the mother whose son is entrapped and serving 30 years in prison is meeting with black and Latina mothers, black mothers who have had their children killed by the NYPD, Latina mothers who have had their children uh, die crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. What comes out of the relationship building that happens really at that level? And I think it's really a understanding that solidarity is not really an intellectual idea. It's not really a mm -hmm. concept. It really is about flesh and blood relationships. And so what happens when undocumented South Asian immigrants say that, you know what, we're actually not interested in the comprehensive immigration reform package if it includes further militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border? Because we've met the Latino mothers who've lost their children crossing the border. And so when people start to have a conception of themselves in ways that is inclusive of other communities and their struggles, and are willing to sacrifice their own short-term gains for the purpose of building long-term relationships, it allows a relationship building, solidarity building that, that's really transformative of, of our movements and of society. There's been a ton of rotten rhetoric thrown around this election season. What's been the cost in, in your community in terms of real human lives? We saw, you know, the increased, the rise in, in hate crimes. Mr. Khan, a man who has uh, attacked 
you know, beaten near death just a couple of days ago, right in Queens, and a black child who died as he was running away from a mob of, of white kids who were calling him the N-word. I mean, so this really speaks to the impact of that. On the other hand, what we're seeing and what I'm hopeful about is the polarization that's happening between the people who are seeing this as something terrible against which we must mobilize in the coalitions that Fahad has discussed versus the people who are clamping down and exposing themselves and really unmasking the realities you know, in our society, institutionally, but also culturally, that need to be unpacked, deconstructed, and rebuilt again. So I'm hopeful in that respect. You talked a little bit about the attacks you've come under personally. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that? What's it been like for you to do this work? Oh God, I mean, countless forums and, and a lifetime of it. And when I say a lifetime, I say that without exaggeration. I'm talking about from the age of seven um, through law school. I had one professor, a black woman, try to protect me from this um, after I graduated law school. But I, I've been, you know, from the very day that I began practicing um, in court on remotely political cases or representing Arab or Muslim clients in 2004, I was, you know, personally targeted by the government for many, many, many years. Uh, my organization was directly infiltrated by undercover officers. Um, I've been put through the grind for a very long time. Uh, what I am happy and proud about is that I hope, and, and Fahad's been witness to some of these, is that you know I've, I've stood up to the challenge and hopefully have made a little bit of space to make it acceptable for Arab, Palestinian, Muslim women to stand and speak on these cases in a way that other attorneys aren't able and to demand the recognition and respect of the court, not just as an individual, but of the political issues and dynamics at play. The New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, did something governors don't do every day, which is to sign an executive order against the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign of Palestinian solidarity. Can you talk a little bit about that and where that's coming from, what you think its impact might be? Without minimizing the resources that are going to have to go into dealing with this, I want to say that I think it was an absolutely brilliant move that really serves the Palestinian solidarity movement. How so? Well, first of all, it exposes the embeddedness and the relationships of Zionist organizations and Zionism and the culture of Zionism in New York State uh, institutions and in New York State governance. And we have to talk about this. It talks to also the detailed minute coordination. And if we had half an hour, I can give you countless examples of this, right? Between Zionist organizations and government institutions, specifically prosecutors' offices um, and other really important state institutions. When you say Zionist institutions, can you clarify which ones you mean? Organizations like the Zionist Organization of America, um, APAC, the, you know, the Israeli government actually themselves, um, the Clarion uh, Project. I've been talking about this for years, but I could not have had the impact that Cuomo had in exposing this, number one. Number two, he's really given a lot of space and airtime to the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, and really making people question, number one, those relationships, and number two, why this you know, stubborn, uh, unyielding you know, support given you know, the now very well exposed Israeli war crimes and apartheid. Right? So I think it was really fantastic that he did that. I want to thank him. The last thing that I'm actually really happy about is that he realizes that he has to do this by force, that it's not going to happen in a popular way, and that he's doing this against a very popular movement. We hear every so often from viewers to the program who say, I'm Jewish, I'm Israeli, and I too think that this Israeli government and its Zionist backers is a threat to stability in the region and, and to my life. Can you talk a little bit about your partners, both in Israel-Palestine and here at home, in the broader Jewish-American, Middle East-interested community? We work with countless um, Jewish anti-Zionist or non-Zionist organizations, Jews for Palestinian Right to Return, Jewish Voices for Peace. Daily, we're seeing increase, increasing numbers of young Jewish people who don't want to be equated with Zionism and certainly want no relationship with Israel. Thank you both for coming in. It's been great to talk with you. We'll leave it there. There's something very interesting happening in Chicago where teachers are organizing community-wide for education, justice, and against teaching apartheid. Chicago Teachers Organizing for Change is a report brought to us by our very own producer, Jonathan Klett. Take a look. The 
the form is not going to cut it. Partial solutions are not going to cut it. What we need is actual like revolution and abolishment of these things that do violence. When we have a mayor and we have a state's attorney who will be willing to cover up a murder of a young man, that's something that is severe, right? No reform can fix that. And we have whole communities that have schools with no librarians, but they have metal detectors and they have police officers in schools. It's really a state of crisis. A lot of the same problems that we're facing, whether it be as black people trying to um, fight against police brutality or state violence, they're connected to other things like school closings. Just how the money is allocated in this city, and that's where you can really see it. Where you have a city budget that 40% of the budget goes to policing, we found that at that time, the police were doing 90% of their time, they were using it to harass folks for 15 grams or less of weed. Our Say Her Name campaign, it counters violence against black women, girls, and femme identified folks. One of the times that we had this rally, we actually marched to diet. You have a young black person who is murdered by police, right? Where we have a city where they're spending half a billion on police brutality bonds related to covering up murders. We still have harassment and oppression of folks in the city before that, and that comes in a form of closing schools. What's happened here in Chicago is that we don't have quality neighborhood schools anymore. Um, the privatization of education, corporate reformers have come in and basically decimated our communities. When they started to close schools, 20 out of the 22 schools in Bronzeville were slated to be closed. Black women, especially, or low-income, low-income women, we receive it from all from all those different sources, right? So it's like the, being the double minority. This attack against teacher unions is very much a gender struggle and a gender battle, whereas we don't see those necessarily those same things in institutions like firemen and police officers. We found ourselves here at Diet about to lose the only public open enrollment school left in the Bronzeville community. This low-income, black, working-class neighborhood got together and said, well, what is our vision for our school? We don't want you to just keep it open. We actually have a vision of what we want for our kids. The hunger strike came about because CPS wanted to deny the best proposal is rightful place. We're on a hunger strike for 34 days. At day 18, the board came out with their decision which was none of the three proposals. We had made the community partnerships. We knew that we had the community's um, approval on this. We had 3,000 signatures from parents within Bronzeville. We had 578 letters mailed to the mayor from the Bronzeville community saying that Diet Global Leadership and Green Technology is the high school that we want. The school will be open next school year. However, they decided to make it a school for the arts. Black youth activists from um, BYP 100, from Asada's Daughters, and from these different um, militant black youth organizations that we have rising within our city. They actually were marching outside of police headquarters on 35th and Michigan, and they made a march from there to Diet High School during the hunger strike. And that was a really powerful moment because it showed that they understood that the violence that's happening within our communities isn't just physical violence. If we connect all of these different issues and struggles together and recognize that this is about improving the quality of life, um, of people of color, of women, of low-income people, that if we understand that and situated within that context, then we actually understand that we're actually fighting one struggle and that's way more power. April 1st, we had a massive one-day strike, which, you know, the mayor was calling illegal, and it wasn't just us. You know, we went out with a number of other trade unions. I think it was 40 community organizations. And it was a really powerful message to, I think, the country to say it doesn't have to be legal to fight back and we need to join forces. In Chicago, it's really a tale of two cities. We have on the south side, there's school closures in black neighborhoods, nine, over 90% black neighborhoods. We have African-American teachers who are laid off more than any other race of teachers. My school is on the south side, predominantly Latino neighborhood. Um, and we don't have the same resources as the North Side schools. In the teaching profession, we are mostly women. And we have our mayor, Rahm Emanuel, who he's going after us. You know, he's laying teachers off um, by thousands. I think if this was actually a workforce of males, this kind of situation wouldn't happen. We have an appointed school board that's appointed by our mayor, Rahm Emanuel. And that's not fair because what we see on our school board is a lot of bankers, businessmen, charter school operators and they don't have their, their kids in the public schools. And frankly, a lot of them are seeing our students as just having, you know, money signs over their heads. Chicago, we're fighting for an elected school board. We've actually ran our own teachers for city council. You see around the country, 
that both the Republicans and the Democrats a lot aren't fighting for us and we need to hold their feet to the fire and run our own people. More information at lauraflanders.com and write to me. Tell me what you think at laura at lauraflanders.com. Thanks.